Um, so I have the pleasure of introducing to you Molly Keck. She is an integrated pest management program specialist at Texas A&M Ag Life Extension in Bexar County. I know um, Bear County. Bear. I I don't remember as Bex. I'm like always Bear County, but okay. So. Molly is a graduate of Texas A&M University with a bachelor and a master degree in entomology. Yep. And is a board certified entomologist and a hobbyist beekeeper. Oh, very cool. So Molly has been working for Texas A&M uh, AgriLive Extension Services since 2005 and specialized in urban and structural entomology, providing pest management and ID programs to match your naturalists, master gardeners, and the general public, school-age student, and pest management professionals. So she is going to talk to us about beneficial insects today. Um, enjoy. Thank you. Sorry, I was up here trying to get this, but then I'm going to try to get all this hidden so that y'all don't see it. Tell me when it's... Let's see, I can do more and hide more and hide. Does that look better? Okay. That, that'll go away once they get in there, I guess. Yeah. Or maybe I'll exit out of it. Okay. Well, thank you guys for having me tonight. Um, my name's Molly. I um, am in the Bear County Extension Office. I'm an entomologist there. Um, and I do all the, you know, bug programs that um, are kind of in the San Antonio area. Um, there's there the closest other entomologist in the um, AgriLife group, I guess that's that's close to you guys is Wizzy Brown. She's my cohort in Travis Williamson County, but this is way close. San Antonio is way closer to you guys than um, she actually is. So um, I was asked to come out to talk today about some of those beneficial insects that you might come across, and I don't know how I magically made that happen, but let me make that go away. Um, I. Well, I'm just going to make it go somewhere else. How about that? Sorry. Grab it. That's all it can go to. Is that okay? Is that going to bother y'all real bad? I'm sorry if it does. Um, I mean, I only do this like 15 times a day. You'd think I'd get it smoother tonight. Um, so when you're talking about your good guys, your beneficial insects, they to me, they fall under really three big umbrella categories. If you're a good guy, and the majority of insects are, you're either a predator um, or a parasitoid. Parasitoids are close enough to predators that I usually just kind of put them all together. You're a pollinator or you're some sort of a decomposer or a recycler. And we're really only going to look at predators, parasitoids. Did, do you need to come up here? Did something break? Um, oh, we lost Zoom. Really? It's showing that it's moving. Maybe they uh, need to... They can't hear me, obviously, but maybe they just need to change their microphone. Like mine will auto default to headphones sometimes. Okay, y'all are good. Everyone's good. Okay. So if you're a good guy, you're either a predator, a parasitoid, a pollinator, or some sort of a decomposer. And you could really kind of argue that most insects and probably most animals may fall into one of those categories, depending on the situation. Um, the oh, wrong way, sorry. So the predators and the parasitoids are kind of clumped together. These are like the killers of the insect world, right? Um, and some of these insects, I don't know if I have any specific examples of them, but the, the benefit or the pest is really in the situation. So people oftentimes in the springtime will send me a picture of an insect, just a picture of a single insect, maybe crawling across the sidewalk. I don't know, just a single picture. Is it good or bad? And that's the only question they have. And that's really a loaded question because I need a little bit more information. What did you find it on? Did you only find one? And I'll argue all day long, one of anything, unless it's a bed bug, um, is not anything to worry about, right? It's not going to tear your house down. It's not going to eat up all your plants. 
kill all your good guys or anything like that. Um, so it's oftentimes many of these insects can be bad in some situations or beneficial in others. And it really just depends on the time of year, the situation and all different types of things like that. So our predators and our parasitoids are the, the killers or the assassins. And um, the difference between the two is that a predator is like a mountain lion. It eats things, prey uh, that are about its size maybe could go after things that are larger in the insect world it's relatively about their size or smaller and they completely consume them so they kill them immediately they don't keep them alive for any way or any reason a parasitoid is the craziest most alien sci-fi thing that you could ever imagine in the animal kingdom um, they are going to parasitize so they're not truly a parasite but they will i guess maybe depending on the definition of that they could be but they parasitize things that are larger than them and live inside of that prey and keep it alive until they complete their life cycle. So I'll show you some examples of things, but they'll keep these things alive. And you think, well, it's still keeping that caterpillar alive that's feeding on my plants. But if you're parasitized by something big, like a squirrel, you're probably not eating a lot. You're not growing. You're not mating. You're not making more of yourself. So that's a benefit. It's, it's, it's reducing your likelihood as a bad thing for doing all those bad, bad things that you do. Um, and so there's a lot of really, really cool parasitoids that are out there. I think at the end of this, I'll show you a, um, uh, I think I have a slide of our YouTube channel where we have cataloged a bunch of our webinars that we did during the 2020, 2021 year. Um, and we did a whole like webinar, se not series, I guess, but a whole hour um, webinar specifically just on different types of these parasitoids. And you're getting a, a teaspoon of all this information because there's so much that we could talk about, but we just don't have all that time to do it. So one of the really cool ones are aphid parasitoids. These are wasps. And you guys know, you know, aphids are teeny, teeny, tiny. If you have milkweed, you've seen aphids because that's a little orangey bug that's on the stems. So they're not very large insects at all. So you're imagining something that is its size or maybe even a little bit smaller, laying their eggs inside of the aphid. And then the aphid becomes what we call mummified. So they get fat because they're these little wasps, these little... Um, they're not truly maggots because these aren't flies, but these wasp babies are developing inside of that aphid and they're keeping it from feeding and feeling good and mating and making more of itself, which is what aphids are really good at is making more of themselves, which causes all the damage on, on your plant material. And then when they're ready to come out, and I think it's only a single one that does it, they make a little hatch, a little hole, just like a submarine top, and they crawl their body out of it and start that whole cycle all over again. And these are really easy to spot if you've got a good hand lens, a good loop, or like just a, a kid's microscope. I call them dissecting microscopes. If you find a plant that's infested with aphids, take some cuttings of it and look under the microscope. And there's a pretty good chance you'll find one of these wasps crawling around trying to parasitize them. And even with your own eyes, oftentimes you'll see the mummified aphids. They just are bloated, fat little aphids crawling around on those plants. So when milkweed starts coming back up again, um, or whatever plants you have that get infested with aphids, take a look at those because it's probably the most noticeable, visible ones to us. And then if you, um, especially if you're a tomato gardener, if, you, if you're a veggie gardener and you grow tomatoes, you might come across these guys. The, this kind of little wasp is called a braconid wasp. And this story I think is kind of interesting. So braconid wasp is like a, an umbrella term for many different species of wasps. So they utilize a variety of different hosts, mainly their caterpillars, but they might go after even some good guys sometimes, like some of the butterflies that we like to see. But one of the species will go after the tomato hornworm caterpillar, which eats up tomatoes. It uh, doesn't eat the fruit, but if you've ever walked outside and it, your plant went from almost blooming and you know it's about to make a ton of tomatoes for you to just sticks and it kind of happened overnight, that's who did it, those tomato hornworms. So if you ever find a tomato hornworm that looks like that, what's happened is a wasp has come and laid its eggs inside of the caterpillar. All of those, count all of those, I don't know how many there are, like, you know, 30 to 60 probably, eggs are developing, babies are developing inside of that caterpillar. So that caterpillar is not doing anything, anything at all. It's feeling terrible. What you're seeing are not actually eggs. Once that... Um, once that larvae inside the caterpillar has finished completing its life cycle to where it's ready to become a pupa, 
it busts through the body of the caterpillar and makes its pupa case on the outside. So you're actually seeing kind of the end of the life cycle. So if you ever come across one, don't mess with it. Leave it alone. Let it live because out of that will come however many more wasps to do that whole cycle all over again. And if we leave them alone, then maybe nobody ever has to deal with tomato hornworms in there. Um, in their gardens, right? I mean, and look at how teeny tiny. It, so that's the adult size, if that's a cocoon. These are itty bitty wasps. They're not going to attack you, get under your skin. Um, you know, they're specific to other insects. That's what they like to eat, not us. And if we had thousands in this room, we'd probably not even notice that they were here. You've probably heard of this one. This one got a whole lot of attention in the 2000s to like 2015, I would say, maybe even in the late 90s, um, but the trichogamma wasps. These are wasps, and there's a lot of different species that are particular about laying their eggs in the eggs of other caterpillars. So people would, you used to be able to buy like little, it was almost like sandpaper. It was a rough piece of paper that you could hang in the trees, and on it was eggs of these guys or eggs of caterpillars or something. Somehow you were releasing these little wasps out into your um, landscape in the hopes that they would help control, you know, pecan webworms or some of the other caterpillars that might be chomping on the trees for you. And what we found after studying those for quite a while, and you don't hear about them as much, is that um, when you try to release them, they don't really do a very good job of staying alive. So if you're finding them in your landscape, they just naturally were going to be very abundant. And so, you know, kind of the, it wasn't, I don't know that it was a fad, but the interest in them kind of waned out because the promise that they could be really good biological control agents kind of waned as well. We learned that they just didn't do that great of a job. So that's only a few of the, of parasitoids. There's all sorts of different others. Um, and again, when I show you, I think I have that slide in there. When I show you where you can go to, to see more about them, you can watch an hour or more about these guys. And then some of our predators, these are the ones that are eating giant amounts of prey. Of course, everyone knows lady beetles, ladybugs, ladybird beetles, whatever you want to call them. I don't know how they get all the other names. Um, they're not a bug. They're actually a beetle. So that's why they should be lady beetles. I'm not really sure where lady bird beetle came from. But everybody knows, you know, what the adult looks like, right? But I I'm always shocked, even with gardeners, how few people really know what the larvae look like. The, the adults, will, after they mate, will lay these kind of golden yellow eggs, almost orangey on, on your plants. And I'm sure there are other insects that lay eggs that color. But if I see that orangey gold egg on a plant, and if I definitely see aphids or other ladybugs around, I leave it alone because I just assume it's probably this guy that's doing it. It's probably some sort of a ladybug or lady beetle. After the eggs hatch, they turn into those kind of alligator looking um, ferocious, weird larvae. And the, and I'm going to show you in the next slide, all the varieties of different ladybugs. So these larvae can, can vary in color also because there's different species and they're super ferocious. They eat their body weight times, whatever, um, in aphids daily. And aphids are a favorite pest of them because aphids have the ability to, uh, reproduce just clones of themselves. So there's massive amounts of, of food source for them in one single spot, but they'll eat anything, anything that, uh, if they're hungry enough, they'll eat each other. You know, nature isn't always necessarily nice. And then after they've, and people, this is what gardeners will say is, well, I killed them because they looked mean. If it looks mean, it's, it's good. You know, you want mean things in your garden because that's what's eating the bad bugs for you, keeping everything in check. And then after they become, uh, after they finish being larvae, they'll kind of get big and fat. They'll usually leave the host plant and they'll turn into that little pupa case. And if, if, you know, when something goes from larvae to pupa, what even it blows my mind, you think that they're building that cocoon over their body, but in reality, it's developing underneath their skin. So if I was going to go and become a pupa, I would unzip my skin and underneath is the, is the cocoon or that pupa case that's developing. So that's, that's what you see when you see kind of that fuzzy stuff or that little spiky stuff, that's actually the outside skin of this guy. So they've unzipped themselves, which doesn't, I know this, right? I know this, but every time I see it, it blows my mind because I don't think that's not how I feel like it should work, but that's how it works. And there's all different species of ladybugs. The one thing though about ladybugs is that they're always either reddish or orangey with black spots. Of course, there's exceptions like this guy doesn't seem to have any, 
or black with, um, you know, like the twice stabbed ladybugs. Um, they could be black with some red markings on them, but they're never green or yellow. There's a bad bug called a cucumber beetle. They're actually out right now because it's kind of, well, it's going to cool down, but it's kind of warm and they love to feed on weeds. Um, but they, uh, I will get calls all the time. I have all these ladybugs in my garden, but they just haven't turned red yet. Well, they don't ripen, right? They start out the color they're going to be. Um, the, the, uh, and then there is an exception to the rule. There is a gray lady beetle with black spots, but I have never actually seen one of those in the wild. They're out there. They're just not commonly found. And, and one of the reasons to kind of bring up that you have all these different types of beetles is that you probably heard of the Asian lady beetle and how it can become a big problem in houses. And it was a, um, a USDA project to release to control some natural enemy. Well, they're really good ferocious predators in nature, outside doing their thing in the spring, in the summertime, and even in the fall time. They just have a really funny tendency, a characteristic to overwinter as adults instead of go through the winter time as a pupa or an egg, which doesn't do anything, right? They don't bother us. And they like to overwinter in protected places. So usually like the eaves of your house. Well, this is Texas. And so as soon as it heats up, which it will do, it will get cold and it will heat up. They'll crawl inside or when it does get really cold, they'll find a little crack or crevice and they'll make their way into your house. And um, up north there are sh uh, where they have true winters and they truly overwinter, they're a big problem. But in Texas, I mean, they're, they're good luck. So if you don't like it, suck them up with a vacuum cleaner and put them outside or just leave them. They're good luck, you know. But I don't know if you've ever, have you ever held a ladybug when one of their defense mechanisms is to kind of, I say they pee on you. If you smell it, it's really musty. So if you have hundreds of them and they're like in the ducts of your house, that smell can be pretty intense. So I can see how in some situations they can be a pest. But in Texas, you got really lucky, you know, it's, it's a good spring coming. Um, and then another good predator, and it's a little bit too cold today. Um, here, I'll just send all of these around. The is the is a lacewing um, or lace wings. And so what I've got in the vials are larvae and then some very, very faded kind of bleach. They're sitting in they sit in rubbing alcohol, so they've kind of lost that color. Not very vibrant adults. And then there's a third little thing in there. If you I mean, I know these are teeny tiny, so you're gonna be like why'd you even pass this around in a second once it gets to you? Uh, sometimes these larvae will get um, disguises and they'll take like lint and debris and cover their body with it so they can sneak up on their predators a little bit more. I think it makes them more conspicuous, but it works for them apparently. Um, and so the lace wings are so ferocious as larvae that the mother lays her eggs on these little stalks. And you might see this, um, like on patio furniture or, uh, you know, your, your door frame or windowsill or something like that. And it kind of looks like mold or like a fungus, something, something like that growing. Well, she lays them on these little stalks because these babies are so ferocious that the first one that hatched, they all hatch about the same time. If they were flat on a leaf together, they would eat each other. They need all their babies, all their brothers and sisters as they emerge, because they'd be wiggling out of those eggs, attracting their attention. And so they you wouldn't have very many of them. So this is an adaptation to survive. Um, I get, I don't really understand it, but I think that it's because they're more concerned with getting down instead of eating each other, I guess. Um, and so it's the one, one way that they survive. The um, And this is kind of what the pupa look like. It'd be really hard to find these. The adults you'll see on a warm night, you leave your porch lights on at night. Um, in, you know, as things start to warm up, if you just kind of bonk your bushes, your shrubs, kind of shorter uh, bits of foliage, I call them garden fairies because they just kind of float out. They're not real zippy flyers. They just kind of float out like a little fairy. Um, and if you find them you or you see these eggs, these are kind of the two indicators. It means you have tons of these guys around. So they are really helping to control a lot of your bad bugs for you without you even realizing that they're out there in the landscape. And then of course, there's lots of assassin bugs. I don't think I grabbed, I, I never, ha usually when I go and do a talk, I always have tons of bugs to show, but the good bugs, you hate to kill them. So I don't really have lots of those guys a lot of times, um, but there's lots of different types of assassin bugs. Let me see if I can move this out of y'all's way. 
little kind of helped. So you could see that one on the uh, bottom left. Um, and assassin bugs are, are a type of stink bug. They're in the same family. Um, they are related to stink bugs. They just are adapt. They're actually not in the same family. They're a different family, but the same order um, and suborder. But they're instead of having long mouth parts that suck the sap out of plants, they suck the juices out of other animals. And the way that you always that I know it's a good guy instead of a bad guy sucking the sap out of my plants is if you're really brave and you want to pick it up, if you see their mouth parts, they're really short. It's more like a dagger instead of a long beak. Um, but who's going to really do that, right? Because if I pick that up wrong, he's going to bite me and it doesn't feel very good. But if you notice, all of them have real skinny heads. So my analogy to that is they are like, well, they're predators, right? They've got to be looking around and, and looking for their prey so they can attack it. So they need a thin neck so that they can have the ability to get more food. So a skinny head usually means it's a good guy. The bad guys, think of like a green stink bug. Its head, you can't, almost can't even tell where the head ends and the body begins. The head just kind of webs right into their body. So a fat head, bad guy hurting your plants probably. Skinny head, good guy, leave him alone. And the other thing is that you're not often going to find many of these assassin bugs clustered and aggregated together on your plants. They're like mountain lions, right? They don't want to compete for territory and for food. So they're they're going to be far and few in between. And then again, one or two bugs on something I don't think is ever that big of a deal, you know, live and let live kind of a situation. Oh, I didn't. I clicked it, so it won't do it. There we go. And then another um, good guy everybody knows are praying mantises. This is a picture of a, a little larva. These are not like a butterfly or um, insects that have a complete life cycle. Their life cycle is incomplete. So they only have three stages. They have an egg and theirs is in an egg case. And you you will often find these. Um, is that a bug crawling up there? Do y'all see that or is it just kind of something on the screen? I think it's a... I think it's a ladybug. There you go. There's your Asian ladybug. Oh, that's funny. Um, those of y'all on Zoom, there's a bug on our on our screen up here, crawling up to the M on praying mantids. So uh, the the praying mantises, mantids, will lay their eggs in egg cases called oatheca, and you'll find these all over on stuff. It comes out real gross and foamy, and then it kind of dries out, and then out of it will come thirty or so of the most adorable insects you've ever seen in your life. And if you've ever found one and put it in a jar, they, you know, nature is not always nice. They don't care who they eat. They don't care that they're relatives of one another. They just want to eat. Right. And uh, over time you'll have 30 really cute little teeny tiny babies. And then you'll eventually just have one fat baby because they'll eat all of its brothers and sisters. Um, so you hope that they scatter and they get away and you can buy these at the nurseries and things, but they, um, they, they, they wander. So I always tell people it's fun as like an activity to do, especially if you have kids. But if you really want it to be effective, buy it for all of your neighbors and hope that they crawl into your house because they're not going to stay close to your yard, most likely. Mm -hmm. They can. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly how many species we have, but there's the question was that they can go after hummingbirds and they're, they're not going, that's not their only food source, but they can be large enough that if it gets close enough, they'll use that as, as food too. That's, you know, nature's not always nice. Right. And you know, they, it just happens, but um, yeah, we have multiple species in, in uh, San Antonio and Texas, not a ton. Um, but I would, if I had to guess, and this is a complete guess, 10 at least 11. Is that what you're saying? Oh, that big? We shouldn't get them that big. You might be thinking of like a walking stick that looks kind of similar to a praying mantis. But yeah, they don't, the, you know, the, lar the largest they might get is maybe three inches, but they get fat. A long, like, you know, 10 inch thing is a, is a walking stick. And it's an herbivore. It's not predatory. Uh, and then there's tons of d different types of wasps um, that are good predators too. And, and uh, let's see, this one, not a great picture, but this is a southern yellow jacket. These guys in the early spring, people will call because they'll see the queens 
overwintered queens that have mated and are starting to look for a new place to live and they can get pretty big and be pretty scary um, but southern yellow jackets if you're messing with wasps kill these guys they're mean 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 they live in the ground um, there are 60,000 plus uh, workers in there they're wasps so unlike bees they can sting you multiple times I mean they're much much more dangerous to have around than uh, even a feral or Africanized bee colony um, but they're they're void dwellers so ground or um, just a hole somewhere it could be like your weep hole something like that but they are um, predatory so if it's just flying around your garden and you're just curious to know what it is you know, that's another one where the situation determines if it's a pest or not. One single one pollinating, eating things, uh, probably not pollinating, but going after caterpillars and things like that in your landscape, you know, it's a predator. It's good. Living right at the base of your tree where you're going to mow and you're going to be messing around over there and you're going to irritate them and they're going to come and sting you. Definitely a, a pest situation. And then kind of the same thing really with all of them, uh, or at least with these paper wasps, there's different species of paper wasps. There's reddish ones and um, kind of brown and brown and yellow kind of striped ones that growing up I called paper, called yellow jackets and a lot of people still do, but they're not true yellow jackets. Um, and if you live with them, you know, they're eating lots of caterpillars for you and they're really not that harmful. But if, if you're allergic to them, if it's in the entryway of where you walk in and out of your house all the time, if kids are going to be underneath that, then, you know, I don't think anyone's going to fault you for wanting to get rid of them. A couple other ones that are pretty cool, the um, uh, thread-waisted wasps or mud daubers, right, that make uh, these little mud houses and supposedly collect lots of spiders and things like that. And there's always there's always a rumor or an old wives tale or urban legend that that um, as I become an older wife, I decide I don't like that old wife's tale as much, you know? So I think urban legend's probably better that they love, um, they always say they love black widows. And I mean, I don't, they don't, they don't care what they go after. They're just going after anything. So those guys are good and really, really docile. And then there's this big, huge one called a cicada killer wasp. And I do have one of those and I have a good big one too. And if you look at it well, you can see that stinger that's in there. That one is confused all the time for, there's a better picture of it, for um, the formerly known as Asian giant hornet. Now they're calling it the Northern giant hornet, which, oh, I have more better pictures, which um, we do not have in Texas. And so all these people are killing these cicada killer wasps. Um, and I don't know, pretty soon we're not going to have any more of them if we keep going after them the way that we have. But as soon as that made it in the news, that Asian giant hornet, northern giant hornet, people were collecting these and, and saying, I've never seen it before in my life. I've lived here my entire life. And you know what? You find things when you're looking for it. I call it the new car effect. You buy a new car, you think you're really cool. And then you start looking around and you realize everyone has that same make and model and that same color. If you're looking for it, it will show up. So if you're seeing a giant wasp, and it's always in the summertime because their primary food source are cicadas. So when the cicadas come out, they become abundant. Um, leave it alone. She's not trying to hurt you. That stinger is meant to sting a cicada. It's not meant to hurt you unless you do something like touch it. And that was your fault if you got stung by her. What's funny about them is the males are real territorial. So a lot of times parks, you're going down trails, the males will uh uh, protect a territory and they'll buzz right past your head and they scare you, but they don't have a stinger. They don't possess a stinger. So it's kind of like ironic, right? They they sound big, mean, and, and, but they can't actually hurt you. Females could care less that you're there. But I think even if that venom didn't hurt, when y'all see that stinger, just the, the size of it is like a needle, you know, just the physicality of it would be painful. So leave those guys alone. You'll start seeing them again, June, July, August, until the cicadas go away. And then there's a better picture of, of a mud dauber with its accordion nest. Oops. Another really cool one are antlions. These are predators. Um, they, uh, you probably don't realize that's what they look like as babies, that middle picture. So, you know, when you were kids, you would see, especially when it's very dry or you have very sandy soil. Um, and, and a lot of times close to like, uh, a, a, always at park bathrooms. Uh, I, that's one place to find them because it's like that white, uh, white, they painted the, the building white. There's always a light on it, that kind of thing. So prey comes to light and it's easy for them to catch it. Um, at least that's where the adults will hang out. But the babies will uh, dig a little 
cavern. And then with those big giant chompers, when ants and other things, not just always ants, will uh, fall into their pit, they come out with those big chompers and try to eat them. So, you know, as kids, you would dangle ants and things over that to see if you could get them to coax them out. And, you know, all you would really see is the head, the body's in there. And so after they're finished being a larva, then they'll, then they'll take pebbles or bits of dirt and stuff, debris, because these are very small and uh, make a pupa case and they emerge and they look like weird looking damselflies. Um, And when they fly, they're like drunk damselflies because they don't fly real well. These are related to lace wings and all of the things related to lace wings. And I can't think of an exception are very kind of lazy drooping, you know, rise and fall, rise and fall kind of flyers. They're predators. So they don't really care about getting away from prey. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> yes. Yeah, they're called doodle bugs. So, okay, so I've always wondered why we call them doodle bugs. That's what my my dad taught me that they were called when we were kids. Um, but I also as a kid called roly polies doodle bugs. So I guess there's a there's a like a nursery rhyme almost that where that arose from, I suppose. That's I learned something tonight. Um, and these, it, this guy is a robber fly. I have a robber fly here, but he is a different, he's a, a bumblebee mimicking robber fly. There's all different types of them. These are cool. You see these in the summertime too. And that's usually when people will say, what the heck is this? Because they, when they make an appearance, they will perch on something and you can get pretty close to it and take a picture before they fly away. And these are a type of fly. They have big eyes like flies do. The one going around is giant, probably the biggest one that we have. And, and if you notice, they kind of, their, their front two sets of legs kind of go backwards. So when they fly through the air, they'll scoop up their prey and they can do some feeding like a dragonfly can in the air on their prey too. They were, when it's really dry and really sunny, they love those kinds of places, but especially that bumblebee mimic is known to if you're a, if you're a beekeeper, you don't really like these very much because they will perch and wait right outside of a honeybee colony and just pick them off as they're flying, and they eat so much. One summer, I had uh, I had I had a new dog. I had a puppy, and so I you know I'm always outside the letting the dog out. And early early in the morning until the sun went down, there was a robber fly. I must have had a, a bumblebee colony pretty close by. It was one of those summers where I just had bumblebees everywhere. And I had this, this bush right by the door where I'd let the dog out and a bumblebee would sit on my potted fig tree to go and grab a bumblebee. And every single time I was out there, he had a different one. And I, you know, I was going to let nature do its thing, but after a while I had to kill him because I was getting pretty sick of him eating. I don't know how many he ate before I decided I was done with it. And it was just, I'm pretty sure it was one single one. Because they are territorial, so he should have he shouldn't have shared his perch with anybody else. But he ate a lot all day long. And then I don't have any of these guys, but surfid flies are both pollinators and predators. Um, these are flies. So if you look at the pictures of them, what I hope you notice is on the heads they have like goggles for eyeballs. So that all flies have these real maybe with the the exception of mosquitoes, have these really giant eyes. So even a pretty bad picture of something is if I can see that those, that those are the eyes I'm looking at, then I can have a really good educated guess that you're, what you're asking me about is some type of fly. Um, And so surfid flies or predatory flies, they might mimic um, a bee or a wasp. They might look like teeny, teeny, tiny little dragonflies or, you know, mimic some other type of wasp like that bottom one. And the adults are the first things that come out when things start to bloom. And one way, one surefire way to bring in surfid flies into your garden as both a pollinator and so they can lay their eggs and they have these nice little ferocious little um, caterpillars that they're real dramatic. You can see that little aphid in its mouth as it's reared up is uh, grow herbs and let those herbs bolt. They love or anything that makes, I say herbs because they have teeny, teeny, tiny flowers on them. And that's really what they're attracted to. So if you if you're an herb if you have an herb garden, it's a little counterintuitive to let those things flower, but if you can allow them to flower, you you will notice them. And the adults are real funny because they're like drones. They fly real robotic, like a fly does, real fast. But they'll almost like look at you, 
and then zoom off and fly off. And you're, it's almost like you're being watched by them. And then of course, spiders, there's lots of different species of spiders. That's a whole, this is a whole other like two hour talk that we could do, but spiders in general are good. There are only two species, I'm sorry, not species, two types of spiders that are harmful, widows and recluse. And I say types because there are like, I think five in the U.S. different species of recluse spiders. And we have a couple different, three different species, at least in Texas, of widow spiders. But they all look the same, right? If you, unless you know, you don't know the difference. They're the only ones that are medically important to humans. All the others, if you got bit by it, you did something to deserve it. You grabbed it. Can they bite? Yes, but I can too. If you put your finger in my mouth, I'm probably going to bite you to wonder why it's in there, right? So you have to you have to provoke them in order to provoke them to bite you. So leave your spiders in your landscape for sure. And then that kind of leads us to some of our other types of beneficial insects like decomposers. So many of these insects are things that you think are nasty or gross, but they have a purpose and a place in the ecosystem. If we didn't have these, we'd have a lot of dog poop piled up, a lot of animal poop. We'd have dead animals that never decomposed. We would have plants that are dead, roots that are dead, that don't get broken down to make room for that fresh and that new stuff. So while they are gross because that's their job, it is their job and they're important. They're like, you know, vultures. They might be gross, but what will we do without them? So, you know, flies, cockroaches, these things we don't like in our house, but in nature, they, they play a really vital role. Just they become a pest when they come into the situation of an urban setting behind our doors, right? So um, some of those, um, I'm thinking that's not a ladybug anymore because he keeps flying and going back to the light and they don't usually are attracted to lights. Um, but one of those cool decomposers are dung beetles. We have a couple different, or we probably have more than just two, but we have, we have a species uh, or multiple species of dung beetles that were brought over when cattle was brought into, uh, into this continent. And then we have some, which I think are the black ones that are like human dung beetles. So they learned and lived to go off of human dung. They go after anything now. They've all adapted to go after dog poop and all sorts of other stuff. But a lot of uh, farmers um, or, or livestock owners really like having these guys in their pastures because it does, they do help reduce the amount of uh, cow patties and dung that are out there. And um, you, these are ones where you can actually tell the difference between males and females. Males oftentimes will have a little horn, right? Um, and What's a cool story about them, I think, is that they together, after they mate, they will roll this dung into an almost perfect ball. And so inside of that sphere is an egg that she has laid and they do it upside down. So if you've ever seen them in real life, they're doing a handstand pushing with their back legs and they roll it, roll it, roll it. She, she or he, I think it's mainly her, has dug a hole about the size of a dime or so, dime to a nickel um, in the the landscape somewhere. So if you're walking outside and you're finding little holes in the summertime, really even all times of the year, because they're active in the fall too, it might be dung beetles that are doing it. And then she'll roll that dung ball, ball into her little tunnel and her baby, when it when that worm hatches out or that grub eats the poop and then uses the edge, the dried edge of the dung to be a pupa case and then emerges as an adult. So, you know, it's, um, I know, uh, Egyptians have stories and uh, hieroglyphics about, you know, kind of the idea as, is that something beautiful like these jeweled dung beetles come from something so nasty, right? Like kind of rebirth type of a thing. But they're they're just cool, cute little bugs. And then we have other types of beetles that kind of do the same thing. I have this box just has a bunch of three different species of decomposers in it. And so those big bugs on top are what are called rhino beetles or more correctly called ox beetles. These are Hercules beetles right here. And since they're large beetles, their larvae will be really large. So if you compost or you put down mulch, um, I can usually well, like farm them if I get a bag of mulch or I've used mulch and I just leave that mulch, half a bag in the sun next to a leaky faucet or I water it often. And at the end of the summer, I can usually dig down there and they, you get these grubs that, you know, fill the palms of your hand, big, juicy things. People are always pet petrified by them. They smash them, throw them away, think they're terrible. They're decomposing. They're breaking that stuff down. They're really good to have. If you find these giant grubs 
in your landscape. I don't care if it's in your turf, where it is. They're not eating, they're eating decomposing organic matter. So if you're afraid they're killing a plant, I would ask you, why is that plant decomposing that they're attracted to it? They're not doing it. They're taking advantage of a good situation. They only eat decomposing organic matter. So if they're found in your soil, that's an environmental indicator. They tell you you have great organic rich soil, plant something there. They're telling you that that's, it belongs, they belong there and so does the plant. And then there's also soldier flies, really common in compost if you get them, if you get it really, really wet. They are a fly and the, when they come around, you can see they have like a little, they kind of mimic a wasp because they have a little white spot on either side of their waist. So it gives them that tapered kind of waist look. Uh, very uh, cryptic flies. They, they're shy. They don't want to be around you. You know how sometimes a fly can like be aggressive around your face and just won't go away. These don't like to do that. If you have chickens in your backyard, any kind of livestock, that wet dung, they'll lay their eggs in it. They break that stuff down, but they do it to your compost also. So if you want to grow them, um, I'll tell you why you might want to in a minute. If you want to grow them, then you then compost, but let it get really wet. And there was a student out of I always want to say it's Ohio State University, but it wasn't. It was somewhere up around there who got her master's degree uh, evaluating different species of fly larvae to determine which ones, when placed in tempura paint, made the best artwork as they crawl through it. And soldier flies are those that will do it. So every summer when we do our camps, I will grow soldier flies in, in or at least try to get as many as I can in, in wet compost clean them off as best as I can. They still are pretty stinky because when you put it, it's almost like fireworks. They, you know, they want to get out of that wet and they make a really cool artwork. It's called maggot art and the kids gobble it up. And then I do have just a little bit about pollinators, um, but this, you know, we could talk pollinators, butterflies for hours. We could talk native bees for hours more, you know, so just kind of real quickly, we have lots of different pollinators. There are, um, for the most part, insects get a lot of attention as being a pollinator and, and um, um, you know, the kudos for doing it. And that's because most of the pollinators out there are insects. You know, we know we have some mammals. We know there's some birds that do it. But by and large, of the 200,000 plus estimated species, only a thousand are not an insect. So I think they deserve the credit that they get. And there's different types of pollinators. We've got um, moths, of course, will pollinate things that like to bloom at night because most moths are out at night. We've got butterflies. Um, most of the best pollinators, though, are those that are attracted to pollen. So pollen is protein for the, for the insect. Nectar is the carb. That's the sweet stuff. Who needs protein are going to be colonies of things, things that are laying eggs. Beetles will go after um, pollen for protein and not necessarily attracted to the nectar. Moths and butterflies are mainly after it for the, for the nectar. So I call them like gateway pollinators. Nobody's afraid of a butterfly. Everyone loves a butterfly. So it's one way to get people interested in pollinators and kind of going beyond that, right? But they're actually pretty crummy at it. We just don't, we just don't advertise that, right? Um, flies are probably going after a little bit of the nectar. I don't think that they're all that much attracted to the, um, pollen, but they might be. But wasps, uh, wasps mainly get their their protein from their prey. So they're, they're at that flower for the nectar, but also to eat those caterpillars too. So just leave them. But the bees are, since they, most of the time bees have a colony and they have lots of eggs and lots of babies to feed, they need a lot of pro pollen. So they're really good at being pollinators. And that's why of all the insects, we give so much credit to bees. And we kind of split bees up into managed bees, which are honeybees. Um, and there are some native bees that are managed. Um, and then native bees, those that are just out doing what they're supposed to do. And we don't have to make them fit in a box and do it for us, right? So um, some of our native bees, and these are definitely not all of them, bumblebees. We have, well, that's kind of hidden down there, but we have a number of different species of bumblebees in Texas that in their life cycle, we're not seeing them right now because and over when all the queens who have mated late in the fall are finding some warm place to spend the winter months. And if a million bumblebee queens overwinter, only probably a thousand. We're finding that less, that very few of them actually survive. So a lot try, but few actually make it out. Um, and so 
they will emerge in the springtime. For us, that's probably going to be, well, it depends, right? Are we going to go through a winter or not? It might be as early as March or April this year. It might be as late as May or June. But as you get into the summer months, that's when you notice more bumblebees because now that queen has laid enough eggs that they take over the work and they're out there foraging and looking for food. And they kind of really peak at the end of summer into the fall. And then you don't see them anymore like we're seeing right now. So they have, they, they don't, they're not like a honeybee colony or some other bee colonies where it's perpetual. Like it, the colony dies and it has to start all over. So if one year you had tons of bumblebees in your landscape and one, and the other year you don't, you didn't do anything wrong. They just didn't come back. It, it's not that one died because it was going to die naturally. They like, they like holes. So it could be a stump. They love stumps. They love the ground. Bumblebees are, um, like a northern hemisphere insect, but they love England. And so when I think of England, I think of like hedgerows and, and these kind of rolling pastures and plains, and that's the landscape they thrive in. So we see fewer and fewer from here because we don't have those kinds of landscapes necessarily. So if you want to encourage them, leave stumps, um, leave kind of uncultivated, loose ground kind of stuff for them. Um, they'll, they'll come, but if they don't come, don't get your feelings hurt. They found something somewhere else too. Carpenter bees look like hunt, uh, bumblebees, but if you look at a bumblebee, they have fuzz all over their body, and a carpenter bee has a shiny hiney. It has no um, hair on its abdomen, and that is a technical term. We actually were tested over that when we were in school. That's how you know the difference. So carpenter bees are not always liked because they'll buzz holes or, or chew holes like in your cedar posts and um, decking and stuff like that. And they can be a, a structural pest, not really in Texas, because we have a lot more to worry about than um, just carpenter bees. But in some places, they are an issue. Um, but these, what's cool about them is that, I don't know if I have a video, if I was able to put it in there, but the way that they pollinate, and, and bumblebees will do this too, is that they buzz pollinate. So they just shake really, really hard and they loosen up that pollen and then they gather it up again. And they're, some of them are so good at pollinating, they're actually um, managed in the Philippines for farm pollination. Leaf cutter bees are another really cool one. If you have crepe myrtles, roses, they tend to really love those types of plants, but then they'll go after anything, they don't care. But if you come across a plant that looks like someone has taken almost a, like a three quarter hole punch out of it, it's a, car, it's a leaf cutter bee. Leaf cutter, there are not every leaf cutter bee does this, but those that do will cut, take those cuttings and they will fill um, holes or cylinders, doesn't have to be super deep, but it has to be deep enough for them to get into it. So it could be a screw hole in a piece of equipment somewhere. It could be um, empty bamboo, you know, a pitcher plant, anything that is, you know, a hollow stem. So uh, if you, instead of cutting all of your plants down, if they make hollow stems, leave those so that they can come and lay their eggs in it. And then the trick is, though, cut it down and kind of when you're ready to cut it back, uh, put it in the corner of your landscape so that they can come out and you can throw that stuff away. Probably like when summer starts, kind of May, end of May, June time, because they should have emerged by then or just leave it there forever um, and always have it be something for them to to move into. But they so they take those cuttings, whoopsie, they take those cuttings and they'll line those holes and also make uh separate rooms inside of those tubes. And it's kind of like insulation. It's the material they use to make their houses. They have a shell that is provided for them by nature or your plastic. You know, I, I keep saying that because I had like a hedge trimmer and um, it kind of sat in the garage. The garage is always open. And I went in there one time and I was like, did my dadgum kids take caulk and caulk up all the, you know, the little holes where the screws were. And it wasn't, it was actually a uh, Mason bee who had done that taking the mud so mason bees do the same thing, but with mud or um, dirt. And one way that you'll know that you've got mason bees is that they carry their pollen on their tummy. So, and, and if you start looking for it, you'll see it. So you can really impress your friends. And, you know, that's a mason bee. That's not a honeybee because um, you see the pollen there on its belly. And you can bring these into your landscape pretty easily. Like I said, with those, you know, uh, hollow plants will do the trick, but you can go and buy things. You can make them yourself. We'll do this in camps or we'll, we'll just have like uh, big coffee cans or soup cans that we've collected. And the kids will wrap with uh, like pencils, pens and markers. So different diameter um, material. I'll give them um, uh, just recycled newspaper 
another paper, paper and they wrap it, tape it off, and then, you know, slide the pen, pencil, or marker out, cut it so that it, it fits in there nice, and then they can use that as a as a native bee home. And the trick is to do multiple sizes. So you might get carpenter bees, you can get mason bees, digger bees, um, or uh, leaf cutter bees, because not every species is the same size. Some of them might be a little fatter and some of them might be a little bit shorter. The, the more, if you get at least six inches, that encourages her to lay females in there. I don't, I don't know why they do that, but if it's less than six inches, she'll really just lay males and you need both, but you know, give her a variety so that she, and she's not only going to lay females in the longer ones. She'll, she may lay a mix of males and females, but only males in the really shallow tubes. So my hedge trimmer was just breeding boys because that wasn't very deep. And as uh, all the leaves are out of the trees and really around central Texas, it's more when the oak trees are pushing out the old leaves to make room for the new ones, people will look up and they will see this, this like basketball or uh, they think they have a big wasp nest or a hornet's nest. They'll always say up in their trees. And we don't actually have true hornets in, San, in the San Antonio area, maybe Dallas, but not this far south. And these are usually caused by Mexican honey wasps, which are pollinators and um, predators. They're, they're good predators of a type of insect called a, 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 a type of psyllid, sorry, that is responsible for vectoring citrus screening in citrus groves. So they're really important down in the valley because they help prevent that. They, they kill the bug that starts that disease, that vectors that disease. Um, and if, if once you know what they look like, and I don't have one to show you, but they're about the size of a, of a very um, stout housefly, right? They're like, how, they're not very big is, is the point, maybe a little bit wider. So not very large. But once you start looking at when things flower and you really pay attention to it, I was shocked at how often I come across these and see them when nowhere in view that I can spot is, is one of their colonies. So if you're lucky enough to look up and find one of these nests, for sure, leave it alone. It is so intertwined in all of those little teeny tiny branches that the whole tree would have to topple over for it to fall out if you're concerned about them, you know, getting mad and, and coming after you. And they will sting. They have the ability to sting, but they're relatively docile. Um, if you mess with their nest, you go up to trim that tree, you're probably going to get stung by them. But I knew a man that was relocating them from one area to another area. And he went out on a cool day and he cut away the branches and he bagged it in a trash can and he put it in the back of his car, not his truck, but inside of his car. And he, so he drove to where he was going to relocate him. And by the way, they don't relocate very well, so it probably didn't survive. But he didn't cinch that bag well enough. And as the day heated up and he was driving, they started getting active and flying around and they never stung him. And I don't recommend that. I would put it in the back of a truck or something, but point being, I mean, he was jostling their house and they weren't trying to hurt him. So they're pretty docile. So leave them alone. If they're, you know, they usually build four feet or higher. So if it's where you're going to walk by all the time, probably you want to get rid of it. If it's hanging over where kids wait for the bus stop, probably in that situation, it's not good. But most of the time, it's way up out of your out of your way, and you notice it, and you think, "Well, gosh, how long has it been there?" It's probably been there a year. It didn't bother you before, so don't let it bother you now. And most of them um, will not survive through the winter for some reason. I don't know. I don't know why. Um, I suspect they kind of outgrow the space they can build, and so they'll move on into other places. But most people that have them will call later and say, "You know, the squirrels got in there and ate it all up." it's gone because they're, they're one of the only insects other than honeybees that produce good amounts of honey, but they're hard. It's hard to extract it because honey is in wax and that wax can be separated really easily. Well, that's like a paper nest. So it's just dirt. So if, you know, I've never tasted it. I'm sure it tastes fine. Every, every nest I have, that's what I had. I forgot to bring my, I have a cute little like softball size nest. Every nest I get has been doused in pesticides. So I haven't been brave enough to try it. I've also heard people say that they only go after poisonous plants. They only get the nectar from poisonous plants. And I mean, how on earth would they only zone in on those things? So that's just silly too. We already looked at those paper wasps. There's your surface flies again as pollinators. Well, 
paper wasps are also a bit of a good pollinator as well. Notice how their body though is real smooth. So another reason why bees are better at pollinating is because that fuzzy body is like a dust mop. It, that static electricity sucks up all that pollen and they are selfish. They don't want to share pollen at all. So that that's what mother nature has kind of done to allow them to drop like, you know, sprinkle like fairy dust, the pollen around. And um, just, you know, we could talk about flowers all day long, but this is just kind of a cool slide that I stole from someone uh, that kind of, you know, who you want to collect, who you want to uh, bring, bring into your garden. He's, these are some ideas for it. But I will tell you that the best thing that you could do, plant things that are purple, blue, yellow, white. And if you think about it, that's a lot of what our weeds are colored like white wildflowers will come out that color because those are the, that's the color pattern that bees are most attracted to. If you want to bring in butterflies, bright things like oranges and pinks and a little bit of reds, but real bright things. But these kind of more muted colors, that's what your bees are attracted to, native bees and others. Um, and then we kind of already talked about that. If you are into butterfly gardening, I have an online butterfly gardening course that um, I'll leave that for a second. You can go to Ag AgriLife Learn is our kind of online uh, website hub. So if you just put in butterfly gardening, it should be the, I shouldn't have any competition up there yet. And then, and then a couple plugs. If you want to be a honey beekeeper, we have beekeeping 101 classes online. And then a couple, um, and one coming up in March in person too. So when I, my email address comes up here, feel free to shoot me an email and say, put me on your list to get info about that. And I can. And then, um, if, if this just, you're like, I want to know more about insects, uh, we do, I say we, myself, Wizzy, um, up in, in Travis County, and hopefully our new IPM person in entomologist in Dallas, we do a master volunteer entomology specialist training or an advanced training in entomology. And what we've been doing the past few years is virtuals, because then anybody can come. And it's a heck of a lot cheaper because we don't have to do lunch and rent venues and all that kind of stuff. It's not out yet for registration, but the plan is I'm the one hosting it this time is September through October. I'm going to try to do seven. I think it's 17 different classes. Right. Because if it's something like that, right, you don't have to come to I like we don't tally if you're at every single one. You come to what you want to. You paid for it. You do what you want to do. But it's virtual and it will be Tuesdays and Thursdays from 10 to noon. Those are some of the topics that we'll do. And it'll go out through. Um, the mass through Mary Pearl through all the mass you'll get it through master naturalists and then there you go there so there's my phone number I'm hardly ever at the office so if you want to get in touch with me best way is to email me if you're into podcasts we have two podcasts that I'm a part of bugs by the yard and then unwanted guests which is more like what comes inside that you hate and I'm going to make this move because that QR screen if you click that, it should take you to put in your email address. And so I, I'll add you to my email deal to let you know about upcoming things that I have going on. One of which is I'm doing monthly webinars, Wednesdays at lunch at noon, 15 bugs. Everyone should know about whatever it is for that topic. So Wednesdays is 15 bugs. Everyone should know about the tree in your, about bugs in your trees. But if you email me, I'll, I'll send out the reminder for that and the link for it on Wednesday morning. Or if you join my email list, sorry. <sighs> sorry. Two minutes. Um, so it's time for q and A. I I have two questions for you um, from the Zoom crowd. One, how about the tarantula wasp? Tar tarantula hawk wasps are predators. They're good. Just I didn't have time to squeeze it into the thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, second one, I read somewhere that um, the increasing neighborhood beekeeping trend can have a detrimental effect overall. Um, have you heard about this and do you have a view on it? I, yes, I have heard that. And I mean, I, I just think it's controversy. Um, it's so when you look at um, um, Bees are not territorial for food sources. So the more the merrier kind of for them, you will find native bees and, um, and uh, 
uh, managed bees at one spot. The other thing is that honeybees are really more attracted to a, uh, like a monoculture, right? That's why we use them in agriculture because you can stick them out in a field and you've got acres and acres of the exact same flower. That's how they can recruit. That, that's how they best recruit to it. Native bees like what we have in our landscape. They like to pick and choose from a cluster of, of, of different colors and different things. So I think that there's room for both. Um, until I see some really hard data on if it's bad or not, I'm going to say, you know, it, if it gets people interested in insects and nature and there is environmental stewardship and beekeeping, then I don't think there's a harm in that. Do you all have any questions in the live audience? Yes, ma'am. I, I have heard that. The question was, do dung beetles get harmed by like deworming medications that cattle will have? And then it's, you know, ultimately in their um, poop. And I can re vaguely remember having a conversation with this or being part of an email thread. We have a, a livestock and veterinary entomologist in Stephenville. And she answered that. And I, it was either, it was one of two answers. It was, I don't have enough data to give an, an a, positive on that or it was no it doesn't harm them because they because no or it was no it doesn't harm them but I don't know I don't know which of those two it was but I'm sure it has some effect on them right it has to they're consuming it too but do does that affect insects or only you know annelids or or whatever these worms are you know they're not annelids but whatever they are flatworms Yes, ma'am. Mm-hmm. Oh, uh, so the question or comment was on roly polies, pill bugs, whatever you want to call them, sow bugs, they can mitigate heavy metals. I've never heard that. That'd be pretty cool. I don't know. Yeah. I, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I I don't know. That's the first I've ever heard that. That's interesting. Yes, ma'am. Uh huh. It so there are lots of different species of sphinx moths. The question was it does uh, the tomato hornworm turn into a sphinx moth? It turns into a type of sphinx moth, the the five spotted hawk moth, or I don't know what the common name specifically is for it. But there are a lot of different Sphinx moths, and then if, and then their caterpillars will be hornworms. Um, it's hard. Uh, a lot of those adults look really similar. I'm not a good moth person, so I'm not real good at identifying them unless they're very obvious characteristics to to switch them up. But the their caterpillar is only a host plant of only utilizes tomatoes as its host plant, whether that's your cultivated tomato or wild tomatoes but they don't go after other things. So if you like, sometimes I'll see hornworms on like um, Esperanza or Bougainvillea in the summertime. It's a different species, not the tomato worm. It can be, yeah. So I usually tell people if you're out there on your porch and, and dusk is setting and you're seeing them in your garden on your flowers and you've got tomatoes, just keep an eye out because if they're flying and they're mating in two weeks, they're going to be chomping on your plant. So, I mean, the adults are fine. And so if you can find the adults and see them, then you can time it to pay attention to the larvae. I wouldn't kill the adult in, in an attempt to protect your tomatoes, if, that's, if that helps. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So